The show starts with a voiceover describing a dream that explains what happened. The Vatans, a collective name for the alien races that invaded Earth on the Arcs, several large spaceships. They are not a single species, but a collection of seven different alien species who evolved on separate planets in the Vatani star system. 33 years later, the Earth is surrounded by wreckage from these arcs and Earth is now terraformed. This was the world the narrator, Irisa, was born into. After the vessels were destroyed and after the arc falls began, we see a large chunk of floating debris descend to Earth. After the terraformers changed the planet, the terrain of Earth became radically different and has alien flora. As a child, the narrator's father, Nolan, says the world has no natives, so it belongs to everyone. However, she's wary of his claim as she is too cynical to believe it. We finally see our narrator sitting next to Nolan, who is a human in a jeep. She's an alien, one of the Vatans, an Arathiant, and she's writing her diary in an alien language. They're heading to a projected arc fall which will be a guaranteed payday, and they see the falling rubble pass overhead. At the wreckage of the Ark Fall, they start looking for salvage in the vast corridors and halls of the fallen spaceship. Moving in they find some intact Vatan tech that they activate as the Earth Republic pays a lot of money for Vatan tech. But as they leave they hear engines from spirit riders, biker gangs who scavenge Vatan detritus left on Earth. And Nolan turns to find several of them, including one holding Irisa captive. They're all Arathiant, like Irisa. They mock Irisa and question her for following a human around. Outside the spirit riders are ransacking their roller vehicle, and the boss demands Nolan empty his pack. Nolan reaches to empty it, and Irisa stabs the man holding her and throws Nolan a gun. He then uses it to shoot a flare, creating a big distraction. Irisa and Nolan run, leaving their roller behind. They get clear and start to move to a settlement, but Irisa is struggling and bleeding. She collapses as she's been shot during the fight. Nolan carries her through the forest through the rest of the night. At daybreak, he buries the sphere they found that's worth so much money, just before ominous noises in the forest cause him to draw his gun. They're being stalked by saberwolves, a vicious and cunning species of manator that resemble a cross between a large wolf and a spider. Nolan shoots and kills one, but apparently they're pack hunters. Killing three others uses up the rest of his ammo, and there's still several left. Fortunately, these are driven off by three humans with guns that arrive at the spot out of the blue. After the rescue they help pick up the exhausted Nolan and injured Irisa. They're taken to what was once St. Louis, the arch still visible and standing though much of the city looks like a forest now. The city is surrounded by alien animals, plants and protected by a curtain force field and is now called Defiance. In Defiance there's a little ceremony going on, and a woman tells the story of the Defiant few that began at the end of the Pale Wars, the war between the Vatans and the humans. The woman is the new mayor, Amanda Rosewater. She is weeks old, and she takes the time to introduce other important people, the Yelex mayor, Nicolette Riordan and the wealthy Datuk Tar and his wife Stamatar who are a Vatan family. He's glared at by human Rafe Macaulay, a mine owner who is cheered by the crowd, much to the apparent annoyance of the Tar family who were greeted with silence. They exchange some snark while in the background Datuk's son and Rafe's daughter exchange Romeo and Juliet glances. In the hospital, Clancy, the lawkeeper goes to see Nolan who is trying to pretend to be unconscious, but not fooling the unsympathetic Indojin Dr. Yulal. Indojins are a technical-minded race who augment their bodies with a variety of cybernetic implants. Clancy berates his deputy, Tommy, for cuffing Nolan, pointing out that, judging by Nolan's tattoo, he was perfectly capable of hurting them, even cuffed. Elsewhere, walking through the streets, Datuk complains to his wife about Rafe filling the crowd with his miners to ensure support. She replies he's only sorry he didn't think of it first, making them both laugh. He's also worried about their son, Alak, running wild with a gang and cheapening their family name which Datuk has worked hard to improve. At a club in town, the Romeo and Juliet story plays out with Alak dancing with Rafe's daughter Christy and her brother Luke objecting. The fight escalates when both sides draw weapons, and they have to be pulled apart. As Quentin, another Rafe kid drags his brother away, he warns him about how dangerous Alak's family is and we learn Luke is apparently involved in something. Later, Nolan tells Yerisa about earning money for a new roller before leaving town, but they can't sell the sphere in defiance since it's so dangerous they could be killed for having it. They go to talk in need want, the brothel, where proprietor Kenya does an awesome job of introducing herself, working up her clients and demanding some basic standards from them. Nolan asks Kenya where he can earn some fast money, and she points him towards the hollows. The hollows is a ring where there's a bare fist fighting match going on, overseen by Datuk on a throne. Nolan thinks the whole scene looks like a great idea. He joins the fight, encouraging Irisa to get some side bets going planning to drag it out as long as possible. In response, Datuk puts in a new champion, a giant bioman who has been synthetically made. 
Next, the fight begins and Irisa takes bets while Nolan doesn't do very well. His punches don't do anything, not even straight to the groin, until he manages to punch the creature in the backside, which topples it. This move wins the match for Nolan. But as Nolan and Irisa leave, Data claims deactivating the Bioman amounts to a low blow, and is banned, taking most of the money off them. They can't afford a roller, but they can afford a bed, bath and new clothes. Later that night at Need Want, Nolan and Kenya get intimate with each other. In the meantime, a Sensoth, a member race of the Vatan who originated from the planet Erath is walking his dog, when he finds a body after hearing a struggle. Lawkeeper Clancy thinks something needs Amanda's attention, urgently. At the wealthy Rafe residence, Rafe notices Luke's absence while they all sit down to dinner. Their meal is interrupted by Clancy and Amanda. The body they've found was Luke. At the morgue, Dr. Eulo concludes that Luke died of a stab wound and cold fire burns, a Volton weapon. Clancy promises Rafe they'll find whoever did it, but Rafe says he'll find them. Quentin tells his father about Luke's fight with Adaktar, and Rafe barges out of the room, ignoring the mayor and the law keeper. Hearing this, Amanda tells Clancy to find Adak first. In the bar, Irisa is sketching Adak at a different table while Nolan completes his business with Kenya. Rafe barges in and starts accusing Adak with his friends while Kenya quickly rushes down. Adak is pretty shocked that Luke is dead. However, Rafe won't listen to Adak's protests that he's been gambling with his gang all night, and he won't listen to Kenya, knocking her aside and starts to drag Adak from the room. And Nolan removes one of Adak's crew, and sits in his seat, pretending he's been gambling with them. Rafe sets one of his miners on Nolan, who unleashes another growing punch and slams his head on the floor. Rafe tries to assure Nolan he's not going to lynch Adak, but Nolan is very not convinced. Soon afterwards, Christy along with Clancy arrives at the bar to tell the truth. Alak couldn't have hurt Luke because he was with her all night. At this point Rafe tries to shoot Adak, but Nolan disarms him. Another miner pulls a gun and fires before Irisa nails his hand to the table, and throws his knife at another. Nolan grabs a gun and Rafe puts his hand up, but Clancy is dead, shot by one of the miners. The bodies are removed and Amanda tries to stand between a furious Dadek and Rafe. She blames Nolan as well before returning to focusing on finding Luke's killer before the trail goes cold. Rafe doesn't see how that will happen since Clancy is dead and Tommy, Clancy's deputy, speaks out. But Rafe has no faith in him. He's too young and inexperienced. He says again he'll do it himself but Amanda protests that his methods already nearly got a kid murdered so they need a professional, which they don't have, at least until Nolan speaks up. He's a tracker by trade and he presents his resume of criminals he's found. Amanda agrees but only if they can keep Irisa as hostage. Nolan takes Amanda and Rafe to the crime scene and reads the prints and blood spatter of how Luke came to meet someone. There's non-human blood and someone who had their leg damaged, but it didn't leave a trail of blood, pointing to a cybernetic implant, which points to an endogene since they make a habit of cybernetics. Amanda remembers that her endogene assistant, Ben, was limping. From there we go to the spirit riders who are tracking a potential arc fall but find something far bigger. They see an army on the move, made up of big scary aliens, that the spirit riders quickly run away from. Amanda calls Ben and after much pretense he realizes she knows. He sets a device up at the stasis net, and leaves. Nolan and Amanda chase his car on a roller, when Ben's vehicle is knocked off the road by a weapons blast which came from Rafe's rifle. Nolan quickly stops Rafe finishing Ben off so they can question him because Nolan recognizes the gun. It's only used by one alien race, and it's not the Indogene. He asks if it's them, and the bomb Ben planted goes off, bringing down the stasis net. Nolan reveals the aliens are the Volge. He fought them during the Pale Wars and Defiance doesn't have a chance. Soon afterwards, Nolan and Irisa leave town and dig up the sphere. Looking through binoculars, Nolan and Irisa see the army moving on Defiance. Nolan cracks, they could make a difference. There are Indogene scientists in the town and they could make a weapon with the sphere. But the sphere would be burned out and leave them with nothing. Irisa is furious, every time they get ahead, Nolan ruins it. He protests there are kids in the town and she says she doesn't care, but he says he does. He knows her better and he raised her better. Irisa drives off angry, and Nolan walks back to defiance. There Nolan's greeted by Amanda and they prepare the weapon. If they can hold the Volge in the pass when the sphere comes online, Dr. Yulo can focus the blast to destroy them. Nolan passes out tactics to the gathered fighters. They prepare on the high ground to drive the Volge into the Terrasphere's killing zone. Several characters we've seen prepare their weapons, including Alak helping Christy which Rafe notices. The battle begins with lots of shooting, 
particularly focused on stopping the Volge from climbing up to their positions. One of the Volge notices Dr. Yule on the scaffold with the Terrasphere and fires upon them, shaking the scaffold and knocking her over. It delays her and the longer battle starts to cost the defenders, many of whom die. Amanda is injured and Kenya runs to her. The tide is turned back by the spirit riders arriving. Irisa among them. However, Irisa is knocked off her bike during the charge and a Volge lines up to kill her until she's saved by Tommy. And Yula finishes with the sphere. The army pulls back and with a large explosion the Volge are destroyed. Everyone celebrates and medical help rushes to Amanda while Irisa and Nolan reunite. In the clinic Kenya sits by Amanda's bedside. Kenya leaves and Nolan joins her and announces that 41 people died in the fight. Amanda says they need to find out who sent the Volge and why. She also gives Nolan the law keeper's badge. He's all she has available and wants him to consider the post. Data and Stama watches Christy and Adel have a romantic moment, and he gives her a ring. Stama explains betrothal to Daedic. Elsewhere a figure in a different city, eating in a restaurant, tells someone that everything went to hell. The new mayor is tough, if Ben wakes up from his coma he could tell Defiance who murdered Luke, and who is behind the Volge attack. Worse, they don't know where the Kazari is buried nor do they have the key. The person he's talking to tells him to relax and not lose heart. It's Nikki, the last mayor. She says when the town is empty they'll be free to search again. The man, Mr. Birch, calls her backup plan brutal but she says they're trying to change the world, and one day the survivors will thank them. The following scene has a mixed flashback to events in the past with a Castathan who fled the battle, much to Daedic's disgust. Running through the woods he ends up in the hands of a Sensoff and another gang of Castathans. He, a law bandic, is taken back to Defiance where a large crowd of Castathan gather for a formal ceremony. While he is tied up, Irisa looks on from a rooftop. He is accused of cowardice by Daedictar and he doesn't deny it. Nolan, Irisa and Tommy approach and Neil tells Irisa it's a Castathan cleansing ritual, but neither of them approve. The cleansing ritual involves putting rocks in a basket which in turn stretch a law bandic. Nolan tries to break it up, saying he was brave to fight at all. Daedic says not to the Castathan, and running from battle reflects on his entire cast. By running a law Bandic dishonored every Castathan in defiance. Nolan mocks him and Daedic explains the ritual and culture behind it, and that without it, a law won't go to the afterlife after death though he makes a cutting point that he has no duty to explain his religion to Nolan. Nolan demands it end, holding the priest at gunpoint, and ignoring Allah's pleas that he has to do it for his family. Which is when Amanda arrives and Daedic asks if, after being mayor for three weeks, she's casting aside the Castathan had with the last mayor since Defiance was founded. Amanda responds in the Castathan language that she respects their traditions, and then tells Daedic to keep their ceremonies confined to the hollows. Nolan leaves with Amanda and is furious with her for stopping him, and she gives him a history lesson. Despite being one of the most numerous of the Vatani's races, there are very few Arathians in defiance. They didn't believe in vaccinating their children and when ex-mayor Nikki decided to force them, they held an uprising. Poorly armed, it was quickly put down and many Arathians killed, most of the rest left defiance. After which the town council agreed to allow the eight races to maintain their own traditions. Amanda declares it necessary. Meanwhile at the hospital, someone takes out the guard and injects something into the head of Ben the comatose Indojin who betrayed the colony. He wakes up instantly, albeit not happily. He wakes up and checks the drug, saying it could have killed him. This doesn't disturb the man, Mr. Birch, since they wanted to stop Ben from talking, and the dead don't talk. After threatening Ben's family he talks about Plan B involving the mines, which Ben doesn't want any part of but doesn't have much choice, and limps from the hospital. At the Rafe household, Christy extends the olive branch but Rafe won't get over her marrying a lack who he calls a haint, apparently an anti-Castathan slur. He asks what her dead brother would have wanted and she says it doesn't matter what he wanted, it's what she and Alak want. He wants her to call off the wedding and she leaves. He tells her if she walks out don't come back as Quentin speaks up. The brother in the middle is the worst place to be. He objects that Christy held the family together since their mother died and Rafe turned on her, while forgiving Luke for far worse. Then everything's interrupted, Rafe at home. Tommy, Amanda and Nolan at the hospital looking into Ben's disappearance, by an explosion at the mine. Seems Ben escaped, went down the shaft and bombed it behind him so no one can follow. The shaft leads to old St. Louis, during the terraforming while most cities were destroyed. Parts of St. Louis are intact, underground. He took materials to make a big bomb with him but not enough to cause severe damage from that far down. They need a new way down, a rat's nest, an unsafe maze. There's no map for it, but Rafe knows the area. Rafe wants to head off with his men, but Amanda doesn't trust him not to just shoot Ben. When Nolan plans to go on, 
Irisa again asks why he's risking his life for these people but he insists and asks her and Tommy to find out who released Ben. And he tells her to leave Allah alone. In their glaring white bathroom attended by servants, Dadek and Stama discuss Allah's ritual. Stama considers dropping the old tradition because it's a new world and the humans disapprove. And if they do have ambitions against Rafe's minds they need more human support. She refers to Dadek's life back on their home planet. He was the lowest caste and wonders why he wants to preserve that system. He says it is because he is now on top, looking down on those below. Alak comes in and starts complaining about Rafe derailing the wedding, but Stama promises him he will take care of it. Meanwhile, Nolan, Rafe and co find the very impressive, huge ruins of St. Louis. On the surface ex-mayor Nikki is packing the rest of her stuff from the office. While Amanda looks out on Allah, she wants to stop it. Nikki points out the Castathans are very attached to their past and their traditions. With their home blown up and them being in a new world, these rituals are all they have to link to the past. Amanda disagrees, with them all fighting together against the Volge has created a new culture. As Nikki leaves she is picked up by Birch, and they discuss Ben's progress, worrying if he'll succeed. Nikki also wants to say goodbye to some people. Birch says she's grown too attached but she angrily rejects that as a problem. She grew up with these people, she's lived with them, of course she became attached. She isn't doing what she's doing because she hates defiance, or because she wants to, she's doing it because she feels she has to for the greater good. Down in the ruins of old St. Louis, they stop for a break and Rafe and Nolan reminisce about the city since they both lived there before Ark Fall. After much bonding, Nolan asks what Rafe wanted to do. He was a photographer. He stopped at Ark Fall since taking photos of the new, radically changed terrain reminded him of everything the aliens took away. Nolan breaks the moment by bringing up not killing Ben. They set off again following Ben's trail until they find an old nuclear plant. Just as it starts to flare to life, a bomb there could cause radiation to reach the surface and destroy defiance. On the surface, Irisa watches Allah's ritual and more people adding rocks, finally intervening when a child moves to add a rock to the basket. She climbs the frame and starts cutting a law down. The surrounding Castathan throw rocks at her until Tommy shoots his shotgun into the air and declares a law bandic under arrest for loitering. In the meantime, underground they catch up to Ben in the nuclear plant. After a brief exchange of fire, Ben falls back, wounded and they manage to deactivate the bomb. Ben, trying to die for the cause, tries insulting Luke who he killed, saying he wanted to leave Defiance to get away from Rafe. But Nolan points out someone is trying to destroy Defiance, including his two living children. Rafe backs down, agreeing with Nolan, so Ben grabs his gun and shoots himself. He dies after asking them to tell Amanda he's sorry. At the lawkeeper's office, Irisa tells Tommy he was stupid to help her and the Castathans will come for a law. He says she made a move and he backed her up. It's what lawkeepers do and what Clancy taught him. She calls it stupid but before they have time to react to that, Dadek and the Castathans arrive. Amanda arrives and declares that Tommy and Irisa were acting under her orders and that she's pardoning a law of all violations of Castathan law and adds that they'll have to kill her to reach a law. At which point Rafe, Nolan and Rafe's miners return home and enter the lawkeeper's office, guns raised, seeing himself outnumbered. Dadek quickly spins the situation to talk peacefully about cultural differences. They leave and Nolan thanks Rafe for the help, though Rafe regrets he didn't have the chance to massacre the Castathans. Nolan also tells Amanda about Ben. Nolan talks to Irisa and she says she doesn't like chains. Nolan tells her she did the right thing. Irisa asks if they're ever going to reach Antarctica, but Nolan says it isn't real. He can't be sure, but he is sure that defiance is real. The town has the funeral for the 41 dead defenders, and, at home, Rafe searches his son, Luke's room and finds a secret cache, inside which is money, a map and a strange golden device. Allah Bandic sits down with his family until Dadek comes for him. Allah thanks Dadek for giving him time with his family. However, Dadek says what he is doing is honorable, and draws out his knife. Later, Allah's body is found outside the lawkeepers. In defiance, Irisa is practicing martial arts when a group of Arathian spirit raiders arrive to trade, much to the consternation of the general populace. The spirit leader asks Irisa, calling her little wolf, if she thought they were in danger. Irisa says the storeholder was and they comment on her badge. While she talks, Irisa looks at the scars on her face and sees them as open wounds. The spirit rider leader reminds her that his offer, whatever that is, still stands and that she should spend time with her own kind. This conversation is interrupted by her being called out by Nolan who has found a body in the woods, complete with entrails in the trees. After spotting a butterfly, Irisa has a flashback to something in the past, something violent. She snaps out of it and Tommy gives her the victim's history, Dalton Taggart 
who runs a bakery in town. At Needwant, Kenya is hard at work when something sharp and nasty bursts into the torso of her client. Nolan arrives with Irisa, Tommy, and Dr. Yule who confirms that by the acid saliva, they have a case of hellbugs. These are nasty critters that eat marrow and line their nests with flesh. To stop them you have to kill the matron. Irisa, seeing a US flag tattooed to the man's body, has another flashback. She recovers and leaves the room, blaming the blood. Nolan follows her. He refers to her episodes which he thought had stopped but she just stopped talking about them. They've been getting stronger since coming to Defiance. He starts to lecture her on PTSD while she repeatedly tells him she knows. At the Tar household, Christy has moved in and is serving dinner to many compliments from Stama who is trying to make her feel very welcome. Dadek tries to keep his snark in Castathan. Unfortunately, she speaks it. Christy and Alak leave and Dadek complains about how Christy doesn't fit in a Castathan household with habits like her bathing alone. He expects Alak to control her. Stama pushes that off as future concerns, for first they need to secure the marriage which means reconciling Christy with her father. Which is what Christy talks about with Alak. Dadek may be an ass but he's an ass who is there for Alak. Before they can talk further, two hellbugs attack. Christy fends them off with a lantern until her screams bring Dadek. His nifty glow knife turns into a glow sword. The rest of the family flees through the back door until Dadek calmly joins them, damp from hellbug fluids, but calm and cocky and more than a little awesome. They go to Rafe's house and the tearful Christy hugs her father. They all sit down with him with Stama presenting a heavily edited version of events that makes Alak the hero. Reconciliation is rapidly on the way. More nauseating fawning is interrupted when Nolan and crew arrive, including Dr. Iwal with a scanner that finds Christy and the Tak family have been doused in the pheromones. They hurry upstairs to wash. Nolan asks Rafe what he knows about the victims. He had some business dealings with them some time ago but nothing since. Nolan asks to see the documentation on it. It takes them all night to dig it up. His filing system isn't great, with no computers or databases and Irisa has another episode. She leaves with Tommy following her while Rafe and Nolan look over the deed for the land he bought, which they in turn got from an Arathiant homesteader. Nolan's suspicious since the Arathiant apparently signed the transfer in English, and Rafe didn't check the authenticity of it. Outside in the fields, Irisa has another, longer, more severe episode with violent memories that cause her to clutch a shard of glass so hard she cuts herself. She struggles and cries while Nolan holds her. During the seizure she has visions of one of the spirit riders, the woman with the facial scars. Back in town she refuses to see a doctor and goes into need want to talk to the head of the spirit riders. He accuses the woman, Rin, of being the one behind the hellbug attacks. He denies all knowledge but looks nervous. She asks about the killing of the past, how he took her in and gave her a new name. He doesn't understand how she knows but she says she saw it, and he gasps that Irisa is touched. He tells them that Rin said she never saw who killed her parents but suspects she repressed the memory. He still says he doesn't know where Rin is, but he can teach Irisa to find out. After a ritual and some smoke, Irisa has a vision back to Rin as a child at the farm. Taggart and Dolan arrive and kill Rin's parents for the land they would later sell to Rafe, one of them cutting Rin and scarring her face. The spirit rider leader tells her to see Rin the woman, and Irisa switches from a vision of the past to see Rin as an adult riding a bike. She comes out of the vision, knowing where Rin is. As they leave, Irisa is angry with Nolan. Her visions were never PTSD flashbacks, they were visions, a natural part of being a Rathian. She's an alien and Nolan's treating her as a human made her afraid of that. She shuts down his attempt to talk about it, grabs some guns from the lawkeeper's office and says they need to stop Rin. Tommy, Nolan, Irisa and the spirit rider's leader head down the mine. Though he doesn't want to hurt Rin, he goes with them because the gods wish it. They go even further down than the bottom floor to a huge cavern crawling in hellbugs and a giant matriarch. Kami sets to fixing the lift while Irisa and Nolan set explosives to kill the matriarch and block them in. The spirit rider looks for Rin, but she finds him, shooting him in the leg. She's carrying a box of pheromones, she drops them, and eventually all the beasts die. They talk about Iris's sight and she tells Rin her vengeance is already fulfilled. She asks Rin if this is how she honors her parents. Rin says yes and throws the pheromones and Irisa stabs her with a throwing knife. Nolan grabs the attack pheromones and throws it at the matriarch to encourage the swarm of hellbugs to attack the hive mother. They escape in the lift and as it rises Nolan shoots the explosives, collapsing the tunnel behind them. Back at the mayor's office, Amanda announces that the land will return to the original Arathian owners, which in turn will be leased back to Rafe's mines. So he still gets to use the property he was party to cheating the Arathians out of. Amanda considers this writing an old wrong and upholding Defiance's values, and Christy is so proud of her father. In the prison the spirit rider chief and Rin talk about her parents, the sight, the gods and her going to prison. 
Later, during the musical denouement, he goes to talk to Irisa and Needwant and Nolan looks a little put out. As the credits begin to roll in, Rafe takes Christy back to the tar house to see Alak. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on the notification, and leave 1000 likes or 100 comments if you'd like us to continue part 2. Thank you.